Hey guys, in this video we're going to go over game number four from the July Swiss tournament that I played in at the local chess club. This game is against Kevin Gausted, and I've known Kevin since I was a young kid. He's been a member of Rochester Chess Club ever since I've been there. Um, he's rated in the 1800s. He's one of the strongest players in Rochester. And we've played a handful of times in the last 10 years, um, kind of since I started my chess comeback. And we've played many times with these colors as well. So I knew what to expect if I went for the Catalan. Um, Kevin likes to play the closed Catalan. So we went for that line. So we see here g3, d5, knight f3, c6, bishop g2, bishop e7. This is the Catalan structure for white, and Kevin is choosing the closed Catalan setup with these pawns all on light squares. Both sides castle, queen c2, b6, rook d1, bishop to b7, b3. So prior to this game, we had played five different Catalans with these colors, and we had pretty much reached this position or very similar in all five of those games. So one thing I did in my preparation was I looked at this Catalan line and tried to figure out could I improve slightly on the games that we'd played previously. And the idea I found is um, 9b3 followed by 10 knight to c3. And in this position the best move is probably bishop to a6 or maybe rook to e8. So both of these are good moves. But the natural move, rook to c8, is a mistake by black. And the reason this is a mistake is because white can now play e4. And after d takes e, instead of capturing right away with knight takes e4, there's this nice move, knight to g5, planning to bring this knight back to capture on e4. So what happens here is white gets a really nice space advantage, and the uh, g2 bishop is going to come to life, and black's position is a little bit cramped. So according to Stockfish, we're looking at around a one point, one point eval already for the white side. So this was in my preparation. And the game Kevin plays nine, knight to a6. So this kind of threw me off. I see the knight on a6, looking at heading to b4, attacking my queen. So I'm trying to think, okay, do I need to act any differently than if knight b to d7 is played? And I did spend a lot of time on this move. So I was up about 10 minutes on the clock prior to knight a6 being played. And I chose knight to c3, kind of following with what I had prepped, and then e4. Okay, so at this point, if Kevin plays d takes e4, I think this is pretty similar to my prep, maybe even a little bit better for white, because I think I can get away with playing knight takes now that there's no d7 knight heading to f6. So after this trade, there's no knight f6. So it's an improved version. Um, but Kevin here surprised me. He played 11 c5. And this is where I went into a really deep think. And this is takeaway number one for me. Um, I really need to work on my calculation in positions where I have an advantage. And this is something that I've worked on with a chess coach previously. Um, I had a grandmaster chess coach for a while when I first started my chess comeback about eight or nine years ago. And he said one of my biggest weaknesses is weaknesses is that I don't realize the advantage very well, meaning I don't take a position where I have an advantage and convert it smoothly enough into a winning position. So after c5 here, I was going through all the different lines trying to calculate, and I decided to play e takes d, and after e takes d, d takes c, knight takes back, and this was all good. So those decisions were good. Um, in the resulting position here, we see the rook on d1, pinning the d5 pawn to the queen. And now what I need to figure out is how can I try to win this pawn on d5? And it's actually not that difficult. All I need to do is calculate moving this knight off of f3. Now we have one, two, three, four attackers, and there's only three defenders for black. So at this point, let's say uh, black plays h6. Now we can play bishop takes d5, and this wins the pawn already because there is a discovered attack on the queen. So if bishop takes d, knight takes d, again there's no time to take here because of the discovered attack, knight takes f6 check. 
so that cleanly wins the pawn, knight g5. And if d4 is played, you can trade bishops, followed by knight to b5, double attack in this pawn, and if black defends, bishop to b2, triple attack, and the pawn drops. So really in this position I should just cleanly win the d-pawn and have a nice uh, setup in the end with like a strong dark square bishop, everything's developed, the black queen is still a little bit misplaced, knight on b7 is misplaced for black. So it's better than just having one pawn. It's one pawn plus some advantages in terms of imbalances. But here I played bishop to h3, hitting the rook. One thing I did not appreciate I mean, I looked at it a little bit, but I just didn't realize how big of a deal it was. Black can just give up this exchange. And the reason why black can give up the exchange is because this bishop on b7 cuts through all of these weak light squares in my position. So if the h3 bishop gets traded off, that b7 bishop becomes a monster. So what Kevin did here is he played knight to e6. And after knight to g5, I was really trying hard to win this exchange. Kevin just takes on g5. And then here I realized I can't get away with taking on c8. I mean, in this position, there's knight f3 check, and I'm actually losing due to tactics. So here I play bishop takes g5. Kevin goes rook to c5, and again I go after the rook. But now in this case, I'm keeping the light square bishop on for now, so that's a little bit better d4 is played. So at this point, white does have a small advantage, um, but it's definitely not that winning advantage had I won the d-pawn. So after d4 is played, this was a mistake by black, now I'm able to cleanly win the pawn. And at this point there shouldn't be any compensation for black. So again, now I have a chance to prove, okay, I can take this big lead and convert it to a win. Kevin plays queen to a8. And one thing that I like about uh, watching Kevin's games, he makes a lot of moves that are tough for the opponent to respond to. So he's very good at creating threats, trying to take the initiative and making it difficult for the opponent. So watch what he does in the next few moves. I take the exchange, but now we see all of these pieces lined up with my king. And during the game I thought, okay, well I can play a3, b4, kick out his bishop, and then I'm safe. So I played a3, and now here Kevin surprises me with bishop to f3. And at this point I'm going into a deep think. I'm down to 23 minutes, Kevin has 19 minutes, and we started the game with 60 minutes each. So if I can work on calculating and calculating more quickly, I won't start to rely on time scrambles to win the game, as we'll see coming up. So after bishop to f3, the bishop attacks the rook on d1. So Kevin is threatening to win the exchange back, and at that point I'll be up one pawn. What I need to do here is calculate. What are the real threats from black? I see the bishop attacks f2, but I could play rook d2. I think what I was afraid of here was moves like knight g4 or bishop to g4. But let's look at them one by one. Knight g4. You can take, take, b4 which kicks this guy, and now knight d5. Everything is looking good here for white. This is a winning position. Okay, well what if uh, bishop to g4? Again, we could take, knight takes, knight d5. We're not afraid of this, because here we could even play b4, but rook takes f2 is just fine. Bishop takes, queen takes. Up the knight. Still have the extra queen side pawn. Black has one extra king side pawn. But this is a winning position. So I play b4. And even though Stockfish doesn't say this is a big mistake, from a practical point of view, I think this made the game much harder for me to win. So Kevin grabs the exchange, retreats his bishop. Now at this point, the plan needs to be can I take this c4 pawn and march it up the board? I need to create a pass pawn. But watch what happens in the next few moves. I offer a knight trade. So I brought the bishop back, which is okay. Offer the knight trade. Now we have this opposite colored bishop scenario. And in my mind, I'm thinking, 
Well, this bishop on d5 pins the f7 pawn to the king. So if I can create some extra pressure on the f7 pawn, maybe get the rook to the 7th, play active with the queen, I can probably play for the win here in a low-risk manner. But what's actually happening is the likelihood of a draw is increasing more and more because I'm not calculating accurately. Bishop to f6. This is the critical moment. The bishop leaves the defense of c5. I need to play c5. But look what I do. I'm trying to slow play this somehow, and Kevin starts improving all of his pieces. At this point already, black is back in the game. It's very close to even. So we make a few more moves, and now we actually start to get into a time scramble with 30 second increment. Um, both of us were down to under five minutes. So I had four minutes, Kevin had one. So here we're living off the increment in an equal game. So what I need to do is I need to go back and really think, how can I convert this win? And this was the same issue that I had in round one and in round two. So against all of my opponents that had lower ratings, I got good positions at one point or another, and I was not able to easily convert the win. I got the wins in round two and four, but they both relied on a very large plunder from my opponent in positions where slowly that advantage was going down for me until the blunder happened. Um, so in the next few moves, we just shuffle around, and I even offer the queen trade, which I was hallucinating here. I thought for some reason, um, if the queen trade happened in bishop b2, I thought I could just push this pawn up the board. But actually, there's b takes c, b takes c, bishop takes pawn, and bishop back, dead draw. So I completely missed that. Um, Kevin, under some time pressure, probably assumed that I had calculated it out. Plays queen d6. And now I don't really even know what I'm doing. Um, I did set this little trap, allowing queen takes h3, and Kevin took it. And after queen c7, there is a way out. Queen to f5 check. But Kevin went for this check, and now the position's winning for me because there's no way to stop queen takes f7. So the game went on a little bit longer, and I ended up winning. Um, but I think the takeaways here are very clear. So across the whole tournament, the main takeaways are I need to calculate more accurately, number one. I need to have faster uh, time management. And that can be improved by playing a lot more games. And, you know, I think number three, I need to have a little more confidence out of the openings with what my middle game plans are. So like in round number three against Master Thompson, I had a bad position out of the opening. Really, I should be more confident in trying to hold equality there. And in my round one game against Michael, uh, same sort of thing happened. I got into sort of a bad early middle game position. So if I can clean up those early middle games, try to secure an advantage, and then work on calculating and calculating quickly enough, I think those are the biggest things I need to fix. Um, and yeah, I think this was a really fun tournament in terms of getting to play over the board chess again, and also it was really instructive in terms of things I need to work on. Because even though I scored three and a half out of four and won first place, you know, the games didn't look like a real smooth three and a half out of four. Every single game, there was one or two uh, things I definitely need to work on. So that's my summary of round number four, as well as the full event, uh, the July Swiss event. If you like the video, please click the thumbs up. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. And also, if you're interested in joining Chess Goals, check the link in the description for our Patreon for $5 a month. You can join Chess Goals, and you get in our Discord server. We're all talking about chess improvement. We have different events running there. It's really a fun place. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.